The big politics in front of the entire world today is to break what I call the firewall. In fact, I don't call it the firewall. The US government and the US top negotiator calls it a firewall. And that firewall is a distinction between countries that have contributed to the problem of climate change and the rest of the world. So there's a sort of division in the world between the countries that have contributed and the rest. And the entire effort is to find a way to be able to breach, close, break that division. Now if you look at why that division exists, if you look at the two graphs here, they're very important to understand. Um, I'll stand here itself. If you look at the cumulative emissions, that is the greenhouse gas emissions that have contributed to the problem of climate change or caused the problem of climate change, if you take the emissions from 1950 to 2000, then you will find that one country, the United States, contributes 28% of the total emissions that are in the atmosphere. So one country between 1950 to 2000 contributes to 28%. If I look, and this is data that my colleagues just put out, if I look at 1950 now to 2007, because there's always an agreement, there's always a thing that till 2000 is not the right data. Um, India, China, and others have actually increased further from 2000 onwards. But if you compare that, it's still not such a big difference. Because if you look at it, one country, the United States, contributed 28% of the emissions that that are in the atmosphere till 2000, that same country, if you look at it, contributes 26% of the emissions that are in the atmosphere till 2007. The contribution of China goes from 9% to 11%. Okay? Contribution of India is 2% till 2000, and it is uh, 3% till 2007. This is very important because at the end of the day what we're really saying is that even if you take a time, if you look at all the emissions, this is the whole politics of climate negotiations. Because you're saying there is a difference between the countries that have contributed to the problem and countries that are today going to add to emissions, but even then if you look at it, their contribution is small as compared to the big countries that have already become rich. So the United States, Europe, uh, and the rest of uh, the rich world. Now this difference was in fact enacted into law, into international law. So you have the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was passed in 1992, which is based on this principle, which divides the world between those countries that have created the problem and, the, and who have to reduce their emissions first and have to create space for the rest of the world to grow. So the framework convention is based in a sense on this, on this table at the back, which is on this pie diagram at the back, essentially saying that you have created the problem, you have to reduce and create space for the rest of the world to increase. So that was the principle of equity and justice on which the Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992 was established. That was also the firewall that was established to say there is a group of countries which are responsible in the first place. They have to take first action and the remaining countries have space to grow, and that's the, that's the uh, agreement. So it was agreed that there is a common but differentiated responsibility of countries across the world. If you look at the Kyoto Protocol, this was a protocol that came out of the convention. This was also based on the principle of differentiation. So it agreed that the Annex I countries have to cut emissions. It, it sets legally binding reduction targets for each country. It's over an average, it's about 5.8% uh, over 1990 uh, levels, which they have to cut between 2008 to 2012, the current period. 
and it was also agreed that the rest of the world will take so we also have responsibility we have to take actions to avoid the growth of emissions and for this money and technology will be provided so the agreement was that they are responsible they have to cut we have been given the right to development the right to grow and for that money and technology will be provided so that we can also grow so that we don't add to the stock of emissions that was the basic agreement that was agreed upon in the world and this is the principle of the firewall and the politics of the firewall today because the principle of rights to the global common were enshrined the principle of historical responsibility of some was therefore established and principle of right to development and responsibility of the rest was accepted now this is what the world is now trying to do is to undo this differentiation so the politics is all about changing the terms of the agreement so that this difference between the people who are responsible and the rest of the world goes now it's important to do this because climate change is related to economic growth as we know it all the emissions of carbon dioxide that are today responsible for um, climate change the greenhouse gas emissions are related to energy as we know it in the world energy transport industry use so it is related to growth the other problem is that some countries like europe and japan have actually reached what is called the technology and emission barrier which means that they cannot cut emissions now very easily they will have to invest substantially in their domestic industry and their transport emissions to actually reduce their load of emissions if you look at this uh, graph from mckinsey it makes it very clear in fact that the low hanging fruit is what is in the first column those are negative cost options now most countries have already done this europe is already pretty efficient when it comes to having residential electronics residential appliances re, uh, rooftop uh, you know refitting homes so that there's better insulation all those things have basically been done the more expensive options are on this side of the table which is where they have to make substantial investment to either change their energy system or to completely move it so that they can reduce their emissions and that's really where the problem today lies and so if you look at the emissions over the last uh, um some years in fact from 1990 to 2009 data that we put together from the united from the UNFCC site you will find that the emissions of the rich countries are actually up by 6.5% over what was their Kyoto target which was to reduce by 5.8% on an average they are up by 6.5% now the politics and all this is that you will never hear this because they hide behind what is known as the economies in transition the former soviet union economies all the eastern european economies and so at the bottom line is the decline of the eastern european economies which collapsed in 1990 so the data that they normally put out they will say that annex one countries have met their kyoto target and that's the gray line over there but actually they are hiding behind the economies in transition because the economies in transition have collapsed their emissions have gone down but they are grouped together into one group called annex 1 now if you disaggregate it which is what we do at csc in fact very i have never seen this disaggregation being done by any other country or any other group because it's convenient for the western ngos to present it also as saying oh the rich countries are annex 1 countries are meeting their emission target when you disaggregate it you find actually the richer part of the annex 1 countries which is the countries which were targeted to reduce have actually increased by 6.5% and if you start then looking at the data and saying well why are they increasing you find it very clear their energy use 
their emissions are up as far as energy is concerned, okay, um, between 1990 to 2009 in percent terms, so that's five and a half percent. Now, if you take the energy use and you further look at it carefully, energy industry is up 13 percent and transport related emissions are up 17 percent. But this is never talked about. In fact, Chandrabhushan just did yesterday a very interesting um, analysis, which CB, will it be available today to everyone? Has I it, think uh, we already have the printout. And I didn't see it in the pack. Yeah, they're, they're getting it. They're getting it, okay. So you'll see there's a, there's a fact sheet on global emissions. And the recent report came out just a week, 10 days ago, from the Netherlands, which said the, sort of the international headlines were global emissions are up. India, China are the countries which are now leading the pack as far as emissions are concerned. Now, if you look at this data, the, the report says 5.8% increase in 2010 as compared to 2009. It says India and China are responsible for this increase. And the third very big message from this report is, this is a Dutch government report, that rich countries remain on target to meet Kyoto commitments. So essentially telling us that we are the ones who now have to take action because they have actually done what was expected. <coughs> now when we started looking at this data, it's very interesting. So if you look at it, between 2009 and 2010 increase, China has increased, according to this uh, uh, report, by 10.5%, 10.37%. India has increased to close to 9% increase between 2009 to 2010. But what the report does not say is that the United States has increased by 4%. EU15, which is the group of rich European countries, has increased in that one year by 3% almost. And Germany and UK, countries which were actually reducing their emissions, have increased by 4%. What the report doesn't say is that these group of countries, the United States, EU, Germany, and UK, actually have legal commitments to reduce, not to increase. So it's very interesting how data gets hidden in these different layers of, uh, of uh, explanation. Then what Chandrabhushan did was, which I thought was really fascinating, is he compared US and India. And again, the message was that, see, India has increased, as I said, India has increased by 9%, and United States has only increased by 4%. So we are the problem, is how the data was presented. Now, if you start comparing and you put the, you start taking the data apart, you find India's, according to this report, <coughs> India increased by 1.6 billion tons. No, it, of, was, it was 1.6 billion tons in 2009. Oh, sorry. In 2009, our base was 1.6 <coughs> billion tons, and the United States base in 2009 was 5.04 billion tons of carbon dioxide. In 2010, when we increased by 9%, India's total emissions increased by 0 0.15 billion tons between 2009 to 2010. Now, United States only increased by 4%, which is what the report highlights. But if you compare it in absolute term, the United States emissions actually increased more than India. They increased by 0.2 billion tons. So what's very interesting is how this data gets presented and put out in the public domain. And obviously, the Western uh, media laps it up. And then, you know, all our politicians lap it up as well to say, oh, you know, India, uh, we are the problem now. We are the ones who have to cut emissions. Now, when you look at this, uh, sorry, the top got cut off. But uh, if you look at the, uh, the Kyoto target, then you find that rich countries are not in compliance. Only a few are, the, except for UK, Germany, France, and Italy. All other countries, if you look at Australia, Australia's target was to actually increase by 8%.
and yet Australia has increased by over 41 percent. See, we just checked the figure, I can't, yeah, it got 41 percent. Canada was to reduce by 6 percent, it's increased by almost 20 percent. United States was to decrease by 7 percent under Kyoto, it's increased by 5 and uh, 5 percent um, um, over the Kyoto target. Now, this is really what the whole negotiations on climate have been. So if I look at the period between Bali to Cancun, which are the climate conferences, and last year when we met, we met just before Cancun, and the year before that when we had organized a similar meeting, it was just before Poznan. So there, you know, each year the, the world meets at this climate conference where people get together to discuss what should be the agreement on climate change. <coughs> now it was agreed in 2007 in Bali that the US would not be, leak, the US action would not be legally binding. Uh, it was also agreed that emerging countries would take on national action, <coughs> but that this action would be enabled by technology and funding. So the agreement in Bali was that Yes, there will be no legally binding uh, treaty, but that the national actions that the developing world would take would be enabled, would be supported, would be financed through technology and through funding. And it agreed that the world needed to cut emissions by 20%. But this was in 2007. 2008, President Obama got elected. And in 2009, countries like India decided that we were too much under pressure and that we needed to be flexible in our approach to climate change. So we went to Copenhagen in 2009 and the world agreed to a completely new game over there. We agreed to the following principles. One, that there would be no legally binding agreement on the rich. All countries would take domestic action. And actions of all countries would be measured, reported, and verified. And that this action would not be enabled by money or technology. Now the politics in this, as you can well understand, is the fact that the firewall, therefore, has been breached. Because you now say that not only is there no legally binding agreement on the rich, but that everyone is equal in the world, everyone is expected to cut emissions, and the way everyone's emissions will be measured will be a common or a slightly different but a common way. So the terms of agreement therefore got changed in three critical ways. One, the distinction between Annex 1, which is as I began saying, that was a firewall, that is the big, big politics between the countries that have contributed to the problem and the countries that come later, that distinction was removed under this new terms of agreement. Two, there is no legal commitment, but as actions are internationally verified, there is a commitment but a backhand approach. Because the minute you say your domestic action will be verified by an international agency, you are taking on a commitment. So it is a commitment, but it is not called a commitment. And the third, most important, most damning to my mind uh, concession that was made at Copenhagen and then Cancun was that the principle of historical emissions and equity was removed. Because actions would now not be based on the contribution of each country to the creation of the problem, but the willingness to act. So you were no longer saying that you have to cut 5% because you have contributed 28%. So it is your responsibility to cut. You are now simply saying we are all equal. We uh, all take action to cut emissions. Um, and we will all agree that our action should be verified. And how much we agree to cut is not anymore based on an international <coughs> mandate, but how much we are willing to do. That was the terms of agreement which was sought to be changed in uh, Cancun. So the Cancun deal was based on these principles, a broad framework, and in a, it was called the Cancun Agreement, right? Rashmiji, not Accord. It, the earlier one was the Accord. The uh, Cancun Agreement was signed, 
And India became a deal maker, as all of us know. Uh, we were part of the uh, people who could now uh, claim to be uh, responsible for this. But the question that we have to ask all of us is, what is this deal? The US agreed to cut, this part of the deal was that the US would agree to cut its emissions by 17% over 2005 levels, which is actually 0% over 1990 levels. But the US walked out of this, and actually its emissions are increasing, not decreasing, as we've just shown you that even in the last year, <coughs> its emissions have actually increased even in the last um, uh, period. Two, the deal was that the rich countries agreed to provide fast-track funds to meet needs of the most vulnerable countries. It was agreed to provide $30 billion at startup and $100 billion by 2020. But there is no money on the table. So whether it is Bangladesh or Maldives or any of the countries that are most vulnerable, uh, they should know very clearly that in spite of all the promises, no money is really, no hard money is on the table. In fact, countries are juggling with uh, development assistance, which was already being given, and renaming it to call it new and additional under climate uh, uh, agreement. And of course, now we are told that they have a recession, they are looking at the collapse of fair economies, and show they cannot pay. So that's really where the deal that was agreed upon stands. So if, if you look at it, they are not in compliance. I showed you that chart on the Kyoto. They are not in compliance. That is a legal agreement. They have legally agreed to cut their emissions. Of course, there are certain countries like the United States that didn't sign the Kyoto Protocol. But nevertheless, the world agreed to a protocol. And these countries <laughs> were legally bound to actually reduce their emissions. So they're not in compliance. They have reneged on their legal commitment. They are not willing to work on a compliance mechanism that would hold them responsible for not meeting their emission reduction targets. They are now saying they cannot pay for money to make the transition in the rest of the world. And they want their responsibility to the problem removed. So the politics in Durban is really all about this. If you look at what's at play in Durban, and Rashmiji knows a lot more than this, I um, just, um, um, you know, the first, first thing really in Durban is to kill the Kyoto Protocol in some way, to have either a legally binding treaty for all, to have a new protocol, to amend the uh, convention, to do anything to be able to remove the distinction between the Annex One and the rest of the world. So I began with saying that is really the politics. And that's going to play out in Durban again, which is somehow get rid of the difference between them and us. The second politics in Durban is that don't, as they cannot cut domestically, it is tough. Find a way to buy yourself out of the mess. So on one hand, there is CDM. And tomorrow, we have a whole session on um, CDM, uh, Clean Development Mechanism, because we want to understand from the government of India what are they doing, and we also want to understand from industry and others. But obviously, there's a big move to somehow make sure that CDM lasts, even though um, if Kyoto Protocol, which it is linked to, dies. Now, we know that CDM was to invest in cleaner technologies in the South and get credits for that additional reduction in the balance sheet of the richer countries. CSE has a view on CDM, and tomorrow Chandrabhushan will present it, because we believe CDM can do a lot more. But for that, we need um, um, governments to argue that CDM has to be used for more leapfrog, for the high-end technologies. How is that possible? And that's something we'll discuss tomorrow. We'll also hear from industry. The other thing is that there is now a big debate about um, um, valuing forests in the world. Uh, the big issue being that forests contribute about 20% of the global uh, emissions is one statistic. Uh, it's very difficult to say uh, whether it's right or wrong. That's because of deforestation, because that then adds to the carbon dioxide stock. And there is also one other way of looking at it, that the more you grow forests, 
the more you can soak up carbon dioxide. So they're both a contributor to the problem. If you cut them, they're also a sink to carbon dioxide if you actually grow them. So if you look at this table, which uh, I had shown earlier, which is the McKinsey chart, what's very interesting is, if you look at the zero cost option, so just concentrate at the middle level. The lower is what you can do where there is negative cost. This side, it is high cost. What is zero cost is in the middle. Now, if you look at the list of what is in the middle, it is reduce slash and burn agriculture conversion. Shifting cultivation in the Northeast should be reduced. Reduce agriculture conversion. Grassland management. Degraded land restoration. Pasture land afforestation. Degraded forest afforestation, reforestation. So those are seen as the zero cost options. Now obviously there is no part of the world, uh, no part of land in the western world where they can grow new forests. So they're looking and, and obviously the south is also looking to see whether their forests, which are both a contributor to the problem as well as sinks, they can be paid for the protection of forests. So this is clearly the other big issue which is going to be in uh, Durban, which is uh, whether we should agree and what should be the terms of the agreement for a treaty or an agree or a protocol, or I, I'm not sure what it's heading towards on what is called red or red plus. And this afternoon before lunch, we have a whole session to discuss red and red plus from different perspectives. We have Sharad here who has been a strong critic of the way uh, RED is being formulated. We will also have people from Himachal and others who are looking at to see how RED can be used to, to, to get revenue for the state and also for the forest protection. So we want to understand that debate a little more in this afternoon. And of course, the third big issue is to use levers to, to be able to get compliance. One other big thing that is happening now is to use trade as a new lever to get compliance. And uh, there's a lot of things happening on the issue of both green technology. There's also a lot happening today with the whole issue of using trade, whether it's the aviation sector and others, to be able to put levies on embedded carbon and on products in terms of their carbon um, uh, content. Um, Again, this evening we have uh, someone from the ministry as well as aviation industry coming to explain to us what's happening with that and an academic from um, uh, JNU who's been working on this issue to try and help us to understand what are the politics that are happening in the world. Uh, this, the other way is to use public opinion and um, I'm always amazed at how powerful the Western uh, uh, media is in swinging the debate on the issues of climate change and are not recognizing issues of equity and justice and dismissing it as saying, oh, you know, we only want to be difficult. And of course, there's also using despair, as I couldn't find a better word, but despair uh, to be able to swing it. So in the NGO circles, we are always told, oh, don't make a fuss because if you make a fuss, then the Republicans will come to power. You know, poor Obama, he's trying to do something, and if you people uh, say that the U.S. is not good enough, then the Republicans will come to power. So it's sort of a threat over all of us to say, you know, the, the guys who don't even believe that climate change exists, they will come to power. And of course, uh, there is the largest despair, which is that, you know, in any case, nothing more can be done. We are not going to do anything more, and you are going to suffer. Your islands are going to drown. So countries like EOSIS, which are the small island nations, are under huge, um, I think, justifiable stress, where they are the ones who are going to be most affected. They are the ones who are going to be worst affected as far as climate change are, is concerned. They are seeing no action in the world. And so they go for anyone who's prepared to even do anything. So for them, issues of justice, equity, right to development, these are non-issues. These are issues that you, they say are an inconvenience because frankly they want action wherever they can get it, however little it is. And it's understandable.
reasonable from their point of view. But that's the other lever. So I, I call this absolutely shameful politics. Now, in the end, you know, the, the problem is that for us, climate change is real. And that's something we have to understand, that climate change is real. It's already dangerous, and it's heading towards a catastrophe. The world has to reduce emissions, and it has to reduce them drastically. It's also very clear that South Asia is the most vulnerable part of the world. We will have uh, some scientists coming in this afternoon to help us through what's happening in South Asia as they're learning to see what's happening with glaciers or, uh, or with the monsoons. And of course, the other sad truth of this is that the poor are the victims, are the worst victims of, of climate change. Now, how do you know that we are worst impacted? The fact is that the impacts of climate change are certain, but they are difficult to predict and to identify. Now, we've had floods in Orissa, we've had floods in Pakistan, we're having floods in uh, Thailand right now. We are having the most freakish weather in, our, in parts of the world. <coughs> Delhi is definitely today much warmer. Most people told me outside that they used the AC last night. It's mid-November, late November right now. I mean, who would have thought using the AC in Delhi in late November? Uh, we are beginning to see all those changes. But is that because of climate change? Now we know that if there are floods in Orissa, it's also partly because of the fact that we have completely destroyed the floodplains in Orissa. If there are floods in Delhi today, we also know it's because Delhi has forgotten the value of drains in Delhi. So when it rains, it, it floods. But it's also very clear that we are beginning to see extreme weather events. Now that's the difference that is, is, is really to is the challenge to be able to identify which of that and how much of it is extreme weather events is actually climate change and how much of it is just variable weather and how much of it is actually caused because of mismanagement of the environment currently and how much of it is because of climate change but even if you were to un sort of look at this it's very clear that things are happening Information that the government of India has put out is basically talking about more rain um, um, across the country, and that's one of <coughs> our biggest fears. The finance minister of India is the monsoons, and so one of the biggest issues is going to be, in fact, the finance minister of entire South Asia, I think, is completely the monsoons of South Asia. So if that is the case, then what scientists are saying is that we will get more rain but you will get more rain in fewer number of rainy days. And that's something I'm sure all of you who come from absolutely the entire South Asia will be able to bear witness to that this last monsoon you have found, the most freakish monsoons possible. What would have rained for a whole year, the amount of rain you have got in just 24 hours in certain cases. So you are beginning to see extreme uh, weather events happening. And so we are beginning to see these changes. We are beginning to see extreme rainfall events, more rain, less number of rainy days, more cloud bursts, more unseasonable variable rain. We are beginning to see trends in mean temperatures, which are impacted in crops. And we are beginning to see the intensification of cyclones, tropical cyclone, uh, uh, sea surges, because of warmer temperatures. We have, in fact, the latest issue of down to earth, which we put in the pack is a report of IPCC, which has still not been released, uh, which will be released, I think, 24th, Sibi? Yeah. 24th, which is the next report of IPCC, a special report on extreme weather events. Now, IPCC, as you know, has been under so much attack that the scientists there now have forgotten to write in English. Everything in that report is so many full of ifs, buts, maybes, if, buts, maybes, that I guess I, governments will be very pleased that it says nothing at all. Uh, but uh, when we have looked at the report more carefully, the graphs and the data put the, da put the information out that extreme weather events are increasing in the world. And that's something we need to really worry about because this is bad news and bad news ahead. And this is when the world has a tremendous challenge of capping the increase of temperature at what is known as a two degree challenge. 
If it's business as usual, then increase will be up to three to five degrees centigrade. So drastic reduction is needed. And in all this, as I said, to my mind, the agenda in Durban should be one, and um, um, should be that to understand that South Asia is, will be, and in fact is a victim of climate change impacts. To understand that the politics is to shift the burden of reduction, uh, cutting emissions from the north to, to, to us. To also understand that countries in South Asia, and I hope we will discuss that today, what other countries are doing as well. I certainly believe as an environmentalist that India must reduce emissions in our own interests. But equally, we should not compromise on our positions at the international field. We must ask for effective action and for just action. So what we must ask for is one, emission reduction targets of rich countries. We must reassert the principle of equity. In fact, we were very happy to see that the Indian government has put in a submission to UNFCC in October, isn't that right, Rashmiji? October, um, that's last <coughs> month. And um, uh, maybe what we could do is, um, I, if I'll, I'll get copies of that, we should circulate it as well. Actually, it is uh, the last page of fact sheet five. Fact sheet so five. The agenda has been discussed with the government of India has put forward as additional agenda. Okay, fine. This is the fact sheet five, last paragraph. Okay. And we're also saying reassert the need for technology transfer and for funding and establish the principle of loss and damage and operationalize what is known as the adaptation fund. Fund to pay for adaptation in countries which are most vulnerable to climate change and where action will be needed. So that's really, as I see it, the agenda for Durban and what needs to be done. And obviously the politics in Durban is not uh, good news right now because the world is actually going through one of its worst phases of being mean, of being difficult, and not trying to do as much as what is needed in spite of the fact that we are beginning to see the impacts of climate change. So thank you very much.